trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley with you again today. And today, we're heading northern British Columbia. Yeah. What's this country? Tell me where we're going today. Well, we're going to the Bulkley Valley, Mike. And uh, the Bulkley Valley is, at one time, it was very remote. It isn't so much today. And it changed, really, in the early part of this century. So what we're looking at when we look at the Bulkley Valley, we think of a number of areas. I think of, uh, of the Babine Range, which is on the other side of Smithers, on one side of Smithers, it's flank Smithers, and then the Telco Range with Hudson's Bay Mountain on the other side. You say this, pr this country has got more mountain ranges and valleys than anybody could imagine. Well, yeah, it's, it's really sp spectacularly beautiful. And the Bulkley River is there's a tributary of the Skeena, and, you know, it, it's rather interesting. I mean, look at the history of this area. In 1800, the 1890s, there was only really one, one town close by, and that was Aldermere. And Aldermere, at this time, was a freighting town, divisional point. The prospectors left Aldermere, and they headed north, they headed west, they headed east, they headed in every direction. But that changed, and it changed when the Grand Trunk Pacific decided to have a, a, a northern railway to compete with the CPR. And the Grand Trunk Pacific launched their plans in 1902, but by the first the end of the first decade of, of, of the, this century, they started heading west, and they, they knew there was going to be a major divisional point in Prince George and another one at the terminus in Prince Rupert. But they needed one in between. Well, this was made to order for the speculators who now flocked into the Bulkley Valley. I mean, without the speculator, I mean, speculators made up, it seems to me, 50% of the population. Boomers, yeah. uh, touters, sure. uh, braggers. Yeah, yeah, they did indeed. And, uh, and of course, so Aldermere thought they were going to be first in line, but there were three other towns, that, at least two at first, two other towns at first. One was a place called Hubert, the other one's Telqua, and then the third one, of course, that came onto the scene very, very late was Smithers. So today, we go to the Bulkley Valley, we go to Smithers and all of the other things, and also a great treasure story at the end. Stay with us as we tell the story of Smithers today on Gold Trails. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley heading to northern British Columbia, yep. north central British Columbia, the Bulkley Valley. Yep. And somebody, Hubert, Telqua, Aldermere, or some other place, was going to gain preeminence for this uh, Grand Trunk Railroad. They were going to grab the gold ring, and all of them wanted the gold ring. There aren't enough gold rings to go around. There's only one on the merry-go-round. And uh, two, two individuals who were promoters, uh, very quick off the mark, Aldous and Murray were their names, and they were promoting a place called Hubert, which was fairly close to Aldermere. But it, and it, Hubert thought they were on the inside track, but at the same time, Aldous and Murray were buying a swampy piece of ground 10 miles to the west, or northwest, actually. Yes. And uh, Were they understood. just hedging their bets, or did no, they know they, something? I think they had an inside track, Mike. I don't think there's any doubt about it. This swampy ground had quicksand. It, had, it was a high water, water table. It was the worst place you could have for a town, so nobody paid much attention to it. But what ha And, of course, Aldermere felt they were now... They were in line. Well, they were established first. Oh, of course. Aldermere, you see, had, uh, they had a, the, the, the Telqua Hotel. They had uh, a general store. They had a bunch of businesses. They had a freighting uh, outfits going out in all directions, long strings of pack trains going out northeast, south, and west. They had the Indians made it at one of their divisional points. Uh, they really were on the move. So we, they thought, Aldermere thought it was a battle between them and Hubert. It was not. Both were bypassed by the Grand Trunk Pacific. And so Telqua, now another, another city is, is promoted by a number of other promoters, and this is called Telqua. And Telqua is really, in 1913, Mike, yeah. it's quite advanced. So you have Telqua, and here's Telqua 1913, and they're all ready for the railroad, Mike. What do they do? They put up a railroad station. Oh, well, that'd be logical. Well, and here's the railroad station. Looks pretty good. They think they're going to be the divisional point. But something happens between 1913 and 1914, because in late 1913, a tent town springs up 
at this first place where these individuals, Aldous and Murray, were, were promoting. At the swamp area. At the swamp area. And here's the tent town. And you can see, and this is pretty rough stuff. Yeah. But they, Aldous and Murray, are right on track because they decide to name it Smithers. After the, the manager of the Grand Trunk Pacific, well, Sir Alfred Waldron Smithers. How and Here's very Sir nice. Alfred Waldron Smithers. This might have the effect of convincing him that he should put up his divisional point right here. Well, obviously, they have the inside track. So what happens to Telqua? Well, between 1913 and 1914, great indecision, great disappointment. They think they're going to be bypassed. And what happens? Well, here we have a, a photograph of Telqua in 1914, probably in April of 1914. Looks great. Look at it in May. This is the next photograph. Gaps of the town have been burned down. Now, whether that was an insurance fire or not, I can't prove. <laughs> it's a little, little, it goes a little bit back for the, you know, to, to prove that. But definitely, after that point, Telqua starts to slip and Smithers starts to grow. The tent town now becomes a major point. And it is going to be and is the divisional point between Prince George and Prince Rupert. But they've got some problems. They and sure do. One of them is the Main Street. <laughs> this well, is grotesque. And isn't there's it? so much water in Main Street, they call it the Grand Canal. I mean, it's that bad. The water was simply flowing down Main Street and did for years, by the way, Mike. They had to corduroy the whole street. Here's an example of Main Street. And here's what it looked like in the winter. Pretty forlorn looking. But the next spring rolls around, and here you have a photograph of Smithers. And it's rather interesting. Only about a dozen people on the streets. So two individuals on the left side of this photograph decide they're going to add a few more. They jump in a, in a, in a buggy that's, that's abandoned, essentially, <laughs> and they're sitting there having a conversation, and the photo photographer picks them up. This is not what I see boom towns as being. You know, I see boom towns as, I, I picture this, the picture of Sandin with people scrawling yeah. everywhere. Yeah. It, it, was slow to, it was slow to catch on. Well, yeah, yeah, it was slow to catch on. Actually, what they, what they thought that Smithers was going to hit the population of, by 1918, of 5,000. It took them about three quarters of a century to hit that, okay? Yeah. And uh, so they were a little bit, a little bit uh, optimistic, shall we say. But Smithers did have a lot of the ingredients. It had a temporary railway station, and there you see this railway station. Uh -huh. And then they had, and of course, they had a roundhouse, and the locomotive is in the roundhouse, and this is the Grand Trunk Pacific. And this is infrastructure. Now, oh, now yeah, once you sure start is. getting this kind yeah. of railway infrastructure, you know sure. it's not going to be readily abandoned. That's right. And here's another shot of the, of the main street. So it's really coming along quite well, yep. and then the trains start coming through. And this is a through train coming through in Smithers on its way to Prince George. And that, this is rather, they didn't always make it, by the way. Look at that. And the next photograph tells you it didn't make it. There's a locomotive on its side, still There's issuing steam, and a guy sitting up there nonchalantly watching it like it happens all the time. <laughs> I don't think it did, but it did happen occasionally. Well, there is nothing like being on top of the wreck and yeah. looking like you're surveying it yeah. for some sort of uh, very official calm, purpose. Very That's collected, right. right. Just, just like picking chairs. Yeah. It was a yeah. tough country from a railway point of view? Yeah, it was uh, not, not, as bad as, not as bad as what... as other parts yeah. uh, because they, they picked, it was, it's generally a level country. It's fairly fertile. It's, in fact, very fertile. The Buckley Bulky Valley for its northern exposure is really quite interesting. It has m marvelous land. And uh, so it attracted some farmers, attracted some settlers. Some of them lived by only by cutting ties for the Grand Trunk Pacific. And they got 20 cents a tie, Mike. That's about all, 20 to 30 cents. Yeah. So you had to measure off the tie. You had to trim it. You had to cut it. You had to do everything is and this, deliver this, it to the Grand Trunk Pacific. Is this giant thing over here part of that? Yeah, that could be used, actually. Look at, look at yeah. this uh, piece of machinery. Sure. And that looks like it would still do the job oh. right now. Look at that. That's good steel. Yeah, that's a slick. A what slick, we call a slick yeah. And that's about 1860s, Mike. So that's very early. Used for bridge building, could be used for ties, could be used for log building, and so on. And a lot of the individuals there were well prepared. One of the most interesting, one of the most fascinating characters in the whole area was a guy called Wiggs O'Neill, which we mentioned years ago in a, in a, in a program about Wiggs the Wiggs O'Neill. Wiggs O'Neill. And Wiggs O'Neill was uh, one of a kind, no doubt about it. When they cleared the land at Smithers, who got the, uh, the, the permit to do that? Well, it was Wiggs O'Neill. He got the contract. And here's Wiggs O'Neill sitting in what he called his touring car, which was doubled up as a touring car and a truck for carrying goods all over the place. And he stayed in Smithers really till the rest of his life. And I think he died in 1964. A guy I would have loved to have met. And Very you could have, but guy. you just 
this character managed, yeah, you and he things. managed to miss one another. Yeah. Wiggs yeah. O'Neill. Yeah, Wiggs O'Neill. And there were other individuals. There was a guy called, and most of them were prospectors or associated with prospecting. Yeah. P. Vine Harvey was the guy. That was P. His nickname. Vine. Well, because they played a trick on him. They, they delivered some wheat. He was supposed to deliver some very good, very good wheat to Vancouver, and they put P. Vine in there, which is the lowest grade. And, and so he got the name P. Vine, which he gloried <laughs> in, by the way. And he was a very interesting guy. He was a good prospector. Came in there just after the turn of the century. And actually, actually, he was uh, renowned for several things. A, being a good prospector, and, and B, when he spoke at one end of Main Street, well, that was three blocks away, you could hear every word, absolutely lucidly. He was a boomer, was he? He was a boomer, he, and, he was, and, his, and his voice was as big as his heart. He was great. He died at 90 in Vancouver many years later. All right. These are some of the characters, and mining becomes one of the key components. We're going to take a break here, come back in just a second, and tell you about uh, some of the characters in the mining business. And, and uh, if it's a one-of-a-kind, it's quite valuable, so people should not love Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley, and we're talking about Smithers, a fine town in north-central British Columbia yep. in the Bulkley Valley there. Just before we get into mining, there are some... This story, this story of this robbery absolutely kills me. Take it from <laughs> word go. What is the name of the guy who's the big hold-up specialist? Uh, a guy called Jim Burke comes into Smithers in early spring of 1929. He gets off the train, walks directly to the Royal Bank, uh, pulls out a gun and says, I want all your cash. They give him $2,000. A lot of money in 1929. Pre-stock pre, pre market crash or post? Just just, just, just pre. 2000 yeah. bucks. But the stock market crash is coming. Okay. And he runs down the street, runs off into the bush, and a uh, word alarm is given, and, 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 and a real estate agent called L.H. Kenny decides to chase him. Now, Burke is armed. Kenny is not armed. Kenny chases him down and corners him in the bush and says, give me all that money back and I'll let you go. Which is very brave of Kenny, because oh. he has no gun, Burke has a gun. Burke decides to play it cool. He pulls a, a wad of bills out of his pocket, gives Kenny the bills, and Kenny turns around, walks back to the bank, and hands them into the bank, and he says, here's your money, and the bank counts it, and says, only $800 here. So Kenny says, well, how much is it supposed to be? 2000 So by this time, they go back, and of course, Burke has disappeared. And uh, what he'd done, he'd gone to Telqua, and he bought some food there, and he figures he's going to hold up for a while and then get out of the country. Then somebody sees him trying to board a train in a little place called Walcott. And Walcott's kind of a little siding there. And the engineer reports it, and they send a posse out, and they capture Bert. The posse captures him. And so they put him on a speeder to get back to Smithers. So there he will stand trial. Two guys are on the speeder. They're both armed. He disarms both of them, puts them off, and takes off for the bush. Takes a rifle and takes what food he has, heads for the bush. Now another manhunt begins, and this time Sergeant Service, British Columbia Provincial Police, takes charge. He has 12 whites in his posse and three Indians. So they decide they're going to set out in such and such a day. The whites sit down to have breakfast, and the Indians say, no, no, we want breakfast. We can find this guy. So they, they take off. The whites are leisurely having their breakfast. The Indians take off under a guy called Jack Joseph, who was a very, very good tracker, crack shot. And uh, in about two miles, they track him down, and Burke is lying there completely exhausted, sound asleep, the Indians come up on very light feet indeed, on padded feet, and uh, he levels his 30-30 Winchester and they tap him on the shoulder. He wakes up like this, he's looking down the barrel of a gun. And that is the end of, of Burke, because they capture Burke, the Indians don't let him go, and uh, he goes to trial. He gets uh, 10 lashes in five years. So and, imagine, uh, I, I picture yeah. this, uh, the, uh, the sheriff and his white posse yeah. having breakfast and the... Sure. Indians come back with the, with the man. Before breakfast is over, I think, but I'm not dead that, sure. That would be just too good. You <laughs> yeah, know, it's got to take a little while. <laughs> so this, now, uh, this tells me two things. A, there are some rough, rough customers there, yeah. and then there are people like uh, Kenny was his name? Yeah, who's, L. H. Uh, Kenny. Who just doesn't understand the well, <laughs> potential danger. Of well, you know, that's the down. way they did things at the, you know, in the early part of this century. And, and that, that company was full of prospectors. There were guys like Red McCabe, and then we mentioned P. Vine Harvey, and there was Kicker Kelly, and there, there was a guy I called Jack Pico, who was actually a mailman, and this is what happened to Jack Pico, and this is out of a book of the, on, on, on this area, and uh, it's, it's really quite dramatic, and here he is slung over the back of a horse. He disappeared in a snowstorm, an avalanche got him, they picked him up next spring and threw him over the horse and buried him in, in Smithers. This was tough country. I mean, yeah, there's lots of snow and lots of hazards, yeah. and, and a lot of people disappeared, I guess. Yeah, and it was mining country. And when you look at the map of Smithers, uh, around the 1920s, there were 80 mining locations, either in the Babine Range or in the Telco Range, and mainly when it was in the Telco Range, around Hudson's Bay Mountain. And in the Babine Range, they had the Cronin Mine, 
And uh, here's an example of the Cronin mine in uh, about 1927 and 1928. And this is shows some of the buildings there. But I, I think the, the biggest mine and the best mine was the Duthi. And uh, this, was, uh, this was in Hudson Bay Mountain. And they took out, uh, their best year was about 1928. They took out about 200,000 ounces of silver that year, plus some gold. And uh, this gives you an example. Here's, here's uh, one of the boilers coming up to the, Delta, the, to the Duthi mine. That is huge. Yeah, this huge Can you boiler. imagine the... And the road isn't great, you know. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is another, uh, another How much photograph. How that way? That would be what? About 20 tons, I think. I'm guessing. I'm you guessing know. a little bit. I saw lots of them when I was a kid, and I, you know, I couldn't pick many of them up, so I don't know. But, <laughs> I, but I think they're about 20 tons, 25 tons. And this other shot is, is, is one, of the, one of the tunnels to the, into the Duthi and one of the ore cars there. And... Uh, and the last one is the sorting shed of the Duthi. And the Duthi... What happens in the sorting for, shed? Well, they sort the, the better ore from the, from the ore that isn't so good. So the best ore at that time went to the, went to the trail smelter. And they would smelt it there because it was silver lead zinc. Yeah. Essentially silver lead zinc. What kind of value came out of there? I mean, how, how much silver? I mean, what, what are we well, talking about? Well, their, their best year, I believe, was 1928 when the price of gold and silver was quite low. Uh, but they took out about 200 and over $200,000. It was a pretty good mine. And there were other mines, such as the Babine Bonanza, where it ran one and a half ounces of, of gold and fo up to 440 ounces of silver. So there, and, and people are still prowling around this area. And it's really quite fascinating. When you look at those mountains, you look at you Hudson know Bay Mountain. You know something hasn't been ocean. found. That's right. They're pro and that's true. And this leads us to one of these lost mine stories. You've said once, uh, for all the lost mine stories there are, knock a hundred of them off, uh, 99 of them will be, will be bad and one will be good. Actually, no. I said 93 will be bad. Well, not worth their, their, their you know, the beer part of tales or s somebody wants to get a, a free drink or something. Yep. And, and that's fine. So about seven out of a hundred turn out to be pretty good. Now this story is, is one of those seven and a hundred. Now I couldn't get all the details, but I checked with a number of different people. And the story is quite fascinating. I think it's still there. And uh, we have enough details to put people in the right direction, I think, Mike. Okay. Okay. X marking the spot in any particular place. What family are we talking about here? Okay. We're talking about the Nickel family, N-I-K-K-A-L. And, and, and the original Nickel was Abraham Nickel. And they lived at Maurice Town, which is the, which is the old Indian village in this area. And they were out on a hunting trip. And we don't know where, because the locals wouldn't tell us exactly, but I think I know where. I think it's between Lorn Creek and Cleanza Creek. And both Lorn Creek was Placer Gold Creek, Cleanza Creek is a Placer Gold Creek, near Usk. So it's somewhere between Hazelton and, and Terrace, but probably close, a little bit closer to Terrace than it is to Hazelton. That's a lot of country. You bet it is. That's a lot of country. And what happens, of course, is they're out, they're out, they're out uh, they're camped, and a guy staggers into the camp, this is in the spring of the year, around the turn of the century, by the way. No, a little after the turn of the century, because it was, it was Abraham's, Abraham Nichols' grandfather who saw this guy. And uh, so anyway, he staggers in. The guy's in tatters. He has no food on him, but he's carrying two tins. And these are baking powder tins. And they can't understand this. The guy's starving to death. And so anyway, he decides he will, uh, uh, the, the, they, they take care of this guy. In other words, they say, well, you want some food, and he needs some food, and he, and he eats too much. They realize he's on his last legs. This guy is more than in tatters. Yeah, he's dying. and he realizes he's on his last legs. He is dying. And before he dies, he reveals two things. He opens up, with some difficulty, the baking powder tins. And they're crammed full of plaster gold. They're just crammed full of plaster gold. Let's have a look at that, just so you can get the feel for this. Yeah. A little bit of gold goes a long way, so... That's about three quarters of Baking powder a tins. Now, what, I mean, how big are these baking powder tins? Well, are these like these little four, three ounces these no, days? No, they, they came in various sizes. I would think each baking powder tin probably held about seven pounds or eight pounds. And I'm guessing a little bit. I don't know what the size of the baking powder tin was, and no one else does up there either. Okay. So we had two of these baking powder tins, and as he's expiring, as he's passing away, he tells the Indians he's grateful to them. They tried to, they tried to keep him warm. They, they gave him enough food, not too much food but they gave him enough so that he wouldn't, the food wouldn't kill him. And he said, find my camp. And he gave them explicit directions to the camp. And the Nickel family knows this, as well as a guy called Tony Lorsa, who's a, who's a mining engineer up there. And Tony gave me most of the information, but not all of it. And uh, he said, find my camp. And he said, when you find my camp, he said, 
There's no, there's no log cabin close by, but you'll see the camp. You'll see the campfire. And in a tree close by, I put some blankets. Undo that, the, the blankets from the tree and look carefully through the blankets. So he passed away within hours. They bury him. And then they spend the next couple of days looking for his camp by his directions. His directions were pretty good. They found the camp. They found the, the campfire. They found where he'd been where he'd been camped under kind of a lean-to, and they saw, still there in the trees, were the blankets, tightly wrapped with, with twine. They opened the blankets up, and there are three more tins of baking powder, but they ain't baking powder. The three tins are full of gold. He couldn't carry five tins. He could only carry two. The placer gold, very coarse, very nuggety, and they spent several years looking, but they weren't prospectors. They were smart, but they weren't prospectors, looking for the original source did this come from a high run? Did it come from Lauren Creek? Did it come from Cleanza Creek? They don't know. There is one clue. The locals refuse to divulge it. He told them something about a landmark in the immediate area. I don't know about that. But I would say... How do you know they got that? I mean, well, I mean there, there is this the, a pivotal part of every lost mine story. There has to be a landmark yes. clue? Usually there's, there's a clue. There is a clue, definitely. In fact, the and number... And you, you figure it's, yes. the, it's a landmark clue. I, I think it is. But... Uh, Tony Lorsa wouldn't tell me exactly what it was, and I don't blame him. And uh, he, he was very forth, forthcoming and everything else. Well, listen, else. when was the last but, time you ever found a lost mine? I mean, well, when was the last time you <laughs> ever found a lost mine? Well, we were on the edge of one when I was a kid, but that was uh, down in the OK Mountain region in Rossland. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's between Lauren Creek and Cleanza Creek, or maybe a high run between Lauren Creek and Cleanza Creek. Uh, there's no doubt that the, the Nickel family, and I think the descendants of the Nickel family, and, and the old man, Abraham, he died about some decades ago. But the family knows some of the information. So the uh, people in the area, if they want to follow that up, they can, they can see the, the, the Nickel family, I think, at, at Maurice Town. I think they're still there. All right. So somewhere, you figure, between uh, Terrace and Hazleton. Is that, that the, yeah, that's definitely, the country in there? Yeah, and or either... And narrow that down. It's probably closer to Terrace, because Cleanza Creek's pretty close to Terrace, a little place called Usk, and uh, so it's pretty close. You've got some artifacts from Smithers here, as a matter of fact. I, I always like it when you find something that you <laughs> hadn't been expecting. Well, silver spoon, common as duck soup, wouldn't well, you say? Well, not quite. First of all, it's sterling silver. Secondly, I got it in, in, in Smithers, and in a very nice little antique store there. And I asked the lady how much she wanted for it, and she said $20. I said, fine, I gave it a $20 plus tax, and threw it in, my, in a bag in my car and drove up to uh, pretty close to Kitwanga, opened the bag and looked at it and said, turned it over, looked at the hallmarks, looked at the uh, lion rampant, looked at the head of George V. Fourth, which is very interesting, and said, wow, that's a great spoon. 200-year-old spoon. spoon. Could be up to 200 years old, yeah. So who in Smithers would have a 200-year-old silver set like this? Well, I think probably Sir Arthur Waldron Smithers. Smithers himself? Uh, quite possibly. So this is truly a keepsake, oh, if yeah, not sure. a treasure, oh, yeah. from the Bulkley Valley. Yeah. I like it. Excellent story. Thank you very much. Bill Barley telling the story of Smithers, finally preeminent after all the others. See you next time on Gold Trails and Ghost Towns.